to Tub Talks with Damon. My special guest today is actually in the second part of a two-part series, Whoa. Tom Dangora. Welcome back to the Tub. You know, you're the first guest who I just couldn't do it all in one. We oh, had to do two parts wow. because there is so much for us to talk about. And you are such a wealth of information, experience, and insight about things that I see differently or you help me see differently. So I really wanted to, to follow up with you, and I thank you for taking time oh, I'm so happy. to do this. So in part one, in case you missed it, so I'm in. we got champagne, we got even more somewhere around here. Somewhere, yep. Yeah. Okay. okay. We good. We good. We, good. we got more. Um, so we talked about body dysmorphia and some of your inner struggles and thoughts about your own experiences. And then we talked about Hillary Clinton and some of the aspects of working within being a central part of that uh, campaign in 2016 and what that was like. A comp. Yeah. It was amazing. It was so amazing. So that is all in part one, if you missed that. And the link to that is right below. Now we get to have fun. But now on the more important subjects of life, it's time that we talk about soap opera. That's right. That's why I'm What's here. a bubble bath without so Seriously. soap opera? So cheers. Let's chop our flutes. A toast to you, Falcon Crest, and long may you live. That's the final line, Falcon Crest. That's beautiful. <laughs> so, <laughs> what are you searching for, Joe? <laughs> tomorrow. Tomorrow. And I tomorrow. can't wait. <laughs> Let's search for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. All right, some of you are going to get that. Which gave us great. Andrea McArdle and Morgan Fairchild. And, and yes. Started both Andrea their careers. Jane Krakowski. Oh, yeah, I did. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right, that's right. Yeah, amazing. So so this is something, one of our shared interests. This is actually how we met. This is how we met. Was our shared passion for soap operas. Yeah. And learning and respecting and covering the soap operas, not just for the entertainment value, but, but some of the creative aspects. Yeah. And um, what I consider to be some of the emotional and spiritual meanings of the allegories that they presented. Oh my gosh, yeah. So let's talk about Huge. that. How did you start to get interested in daytime soap operas? Well, my story is many people's stories with my grandmother uh -huh. when I was six. Uh, I remember, you know, we talked about me being a big boy uh -huh. and whatnot. So, you know, uh, my best friend when I was a kid was my grandmother. And um, yeah, I would, every, I would, especially summer vacations, would, you know, watch them with her every day from Ryan's Hope through on ABC. So you were the ABC lineup. Oh, yeah. And back yeah. then. Until I, she got I, sick of General Hospital and we switched to Santa Barbara. Oh, wow. Yeah, which I actually liked. So she kind of went in the opposite direction because General Hospital became such the center of attention yeah. throughout the, the well, early had, 1980s. Well, it, it, it had its slow spot. It got shaky yeah. after yeah. that initial uh, Luke and Laura yeah. thing. Yeah, the, the, you know, Gloria Monty's lightning did not strike yes. twice. Yes, you yes. Know, so they, they went through some... Yeah, I think the loss, of, the loss of Luke and Laura hurt. Yeah. Okay, so you grew up watching the ABC lineup. Yes, but your mostly All My Children, One Life to Live, but mostly, but One Life to Live was my favorite, favorite. But I loved, Why? loved Why was All One My Life Children. to Live your favorite? Oh, it was just so fabulous. I was obsessed with Dorian. I really, really was. So was this Robin Strauss? Yes, yes, yes. There yes, were quite a few yes, Dorians. Yes, but no, well, um, as Erica Slezak says, there were many Dorians, but there was only one Dorian. Absolutely. <laughs> and I had to go I'll into, I had that to go into her phrasing. Yes, that's um, right. Dorian. Um, Only one Dorian, several actresses. Yes, one Dorian, and several people. Of them several, got... several, you know, I think it is that several people play Dorian. Only one person was Dorian. Yes. Um, and that's important. I mean, that was important for me as a viewer. What Robin Strasser brought to the screen was was unlike pretty much anything else you see on oh, TV yeah. or movies. It's not just like she was acting. She was existing. Yes, yes. And for me, I don't know if for you, but for so many people, so many gay men who watched her, she gave us a sense of confidence. No. How to navigate the world. Hardcore. I was six, and I would go to school and not, not answer to my name. I would say, I only answer to Dorian now. Whoa. No, and so my mother gets called to the principal's <laughs> office because they're absolutely alarmed by this. First off, they can't believe I'm allowed to watch that programming. But then, you know, it's 1986, and a six, seven-year-old boy um, wants to be called Dorian Lord. <laughs> so my so mom, you're in school insisting on being called Dorian Lord. Did you have a hat? Um, at times. Um, you weren't allowed to wear hats, though. It's okay. okay. But, um... <laughs> for those who don't know, Dorian is very she popular. She loved her hats. Many, Not many so hats. much in the 80s, though. Oh, really? Not, not the same, because she had the okay. big hair. She, gorgeous. Gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, 
So I was like, I called it out, and I was like, oh, what's my... And my mother, uh, who also loved my wife to live, mm -hmm. comes in. She was very a very young mother, so she was probably like 25, 26 at this point. She comes in, chain smoking, as always, as, as most Boston mothers did in the 80s, um, holding a giant Dunkin' Donuts, and she's just sitting there like, what now? Like, to the, not to me, the principal, chain smoking, just like, and he said, ma'am, aren't you concerned your son wants to be Dorian Lord from a soap opera? And she took a big puff of his cigarette and goes, why wouldn't he? Dorian's fucking fabulous. Call him whatever he wants to be called. You know, so. Yeah, mom. Robin so, loves that story. Oh, I love that. Did you identify with other characters? Did you feel like you were a part of you were Vicky, Tina? Tina? Vicky, Tina, Dorian were my trifecta, yeah. of course, as anyone with taste would say. Uh -huh. I mean, it was just it's amazing. That was well, that was the thing that was so... And I didn't know, you know, I grew up to be this feminist and like such a, you know, go women type person. But um, that was also part of it is One Life to Live was the show where your leads were women. Like your your main couple were not romantic, but it was Vicky and Dorian. Like, so your main duo were frenemies, you know? And it was so strong. And Tina was the, was the, was the third heat of it. So like the, the top three things when One Life to Live was number one, or at its highest point, were three women that carried the show, you know? You had Erica Kane, but you also had Adam Chandler mm -hmm. and Tad Martin, you know? Or Adam, especially then, Adam Chandler was ruling it winning the Emmy every year, as he should have. Of course, it's brilliant. May he rest, but, you know. David Kinnear. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I don't, it's just, and then also, so you're six, seven years old, there's all that, there's all that fun soap stuff, but then Vicky goes to heaven. She goes back in, t Clint goes back in time, 100 years to 1888. They find a lost city under Lantana Mountain of Eterna. Like, that's cool shit. Uh, Phobo was the 80s, you know, where Patrick London uh, came back as, Fake Bo. Oh, oh, oh. Fobo. Fobo. Yeah, they called it Fobo. Yeah. And Dee Dee died in an electric fence. Like, yeah. uh, the soap within a soap, yeah. fraternity row. Like, it was, all, it was also so exciting and fun and, like, so it was just so awesome. It was so crazy to watch and it just lasted. It just lasted. The momentum, like, it, to the final episode, the pulse of that show never went away. Mm -hmm. It didn't have many lulls. It's, you know, it's, it's hard to go back and watch. You can pick any episode and something insane is happening. I always said the reason I loved One Life to Live is because any given Tuesday was a Friday episode. Mm -hmm. If you don't know so, if the Friday episode's really big, it's your cliffhanger. You have to do something huge in that episode to make sure the viewer can go through two whole days and tune in again. You know, so that's what it is. But One Life, it did, the, someone major could die on a Tuesday. Mm. It was crazy. Wow. Which was rare in that day. I mean, they really yeah, did plan a big event Friday. on Fridays. Always. And one right. life to live. Anything can happen at any time. Right. One life, to me, always felt more cinematic than any of who, No matter who the executive producer right. was. Right. Especially with it Paul. It felt with Paul Rausch and with uh, the person whose name I'm forgetting from Dirty Dancing, Linda Gottlieb. Yeah, Linda. Uh, they really put so much effort into the craft to make it aesthetically interesting. Yeah, I mean, certainly there were there were miss shots, you know, yeah. like they have their um, they those ten years are not without their controversy. Well, sure, no, right? but I mean, but, you try doing two hundred and sixty episodes yeah. of a one hour show, yeah, yeah, yeah. for forty years, and you're gonna have missteps. Yo, no, absolutely. But but a lot of what they did was, resonated with us. That was viewers. fabulous. Have you read the book, The Oral History of One Life to the Land View? No. Where it basically it's I wish I thought of this because I just can't imagine what sitting in these interviews were like. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's I've probably read it ten times now. It's fascinating. They go from the beginning to the end, and there's no no one there's no narrative. It is just uh, hundreds of interviews from cast and crew pieced together to tell the entire history of the show. And people go, do you Up know to the end? Yep. Do you know Larry Woolock wasn't not forget not being allowed to even make a cameo at the end in mm -hmm. the hospital? Mm -hmm. They didn't let him go to the rap party. Why? He said, "Well, can I at least come to the party?" And they said, "Oh, we're sorry, we don't have room." Kristen Alderson's aunt Randy was there. <laughs> Kristen's Aunt Randy went. We love Aunt Randy. She's fabulous. But Kristen Alderson. Yes. But Larry was yeah. on for 40 years. Why did they treat him so badly? Because I don't know why did they treat everyone so badly. I don't know. I don't know why they were all so awful. Well, by that point, ABC shows had been really sabotaged by behind the scenes. Oh, yeah. Higher up. You know, the Disney yeah. folks 
love ABC, and then they put Brian Franz in charge. The worst man ever, next to Comey. And Brian, <laughs> it's our shit list today. It's people who ruined Tom's James life Comey for and no Brian reason. Franz, in that order. I don't ask for much. I just like older women with smart blonde haircuts that wear blazers to do well. That's all I want. On screen and off screen. On and off. I know, we hate the men that sabotage I them. like a strong matriarch. Yes. So for whatever reason, Disney put him in charge of pretty much decimating yep, like, this beloved lineup, and he did it, and they did and, it. You know, credit needs to be given to um, Frank uh, Valentini mm -hmm. from One Life to Live, because the way they kept... It felt like they made the show got better mm -hmm. in spite of it. I felt like every time Disney or ABC or Franz or any of them just threw something at, at the brilliant production team One Life to Live... They would go, okay, great, challenge accepted. The show just got better, we added more viewers. Ha ha. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, which oh. they were doing. Oh, they were, oh my god, they yeah. went out at number one. Yeah. Okay, controversial question. What did you think about the uh, Jill Farron Phelps years of One Life? I mean, I don't, have, like, I love, like, I don't know, I'm mixed. I was really young, I loved the show so, so much. Mm -hmm. I look back at it now and I get it, but I mean, like, think of, like, Think of some of the things we got from those years. Think of the characters we got. Like, there's good stuff there. Um, I wish Kevin was gay. That mm. would have been magical, right? Yeah. Because well, Kevin was supposed to be gay. I, yeah. Not Billy. Yeah. Like, that, that was, was much earlier. Story, that was, I think, the early 90s. The, 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 that was, um... Wait, what was Kevin supposed to be gay? Wasn't Kevin supposed to I be gay? I think that was what, what supposed to be in the early 90s. Okay. That was Lily Gottlieb's. No, I know, era. no, I know. Um, and then they, the network wouldn't allow that, so they went with this other... Uh, yes, Ryan Phillippe's character. Yeah, I'm literally yeah. flipping the decade. I yes. literally am flipping yeah. 2000. And Jill Farron Phelps was the late 90s. Yes. No, and that's, it's stagnant, but like, I mean, I rewatch, I just, uh, during the pandemic, I watched 98 to 2002 again. Uh -huh. No, but like, cool stuff. Like, the Lindsay Rappaport years are epic. Yeah. Epic. Um, the Man on the Wheel is Real. The Man on the Wheel is Real. Mm -hmm. It's so good. Uh -huh. Like, that shit's so good. Yeah. A lot of times when new people come in, I think they believe they have to like throw so much youth at us mm -hmm. and they have to like push the legacy characters to the side. Mm -hmm. Spoiler alert, if you've been on forever, we, we don't care if you're 90, we love you. Yeah. Like I would have taken Myrtle seven days a week yeah. on all my children. Wanda, should have, I loved Wanda. Yeah. Serve me some food, Wanda, I'm in. Like we don't want, like you can, you can slow burn the new characters, but you cannot shove them down our throat because we want the legacy characters. End of discussion. Um, you know, um, but there were great things came out of it, I think. Natalie, mm -hmm. right? Natalie mm -hmm. was then, yeah. Yeah, and that was that era. And Natalie became a forever. Right. But you'd never do the show again without Natalie, right. ever. Never the return of CJ. Is that not the wildest thing? Tina's kid. Yeah. Tina. We got Sarah back, yeah. what, three times? Yeah. Never a CJ? These mysteries. These I mysteries. Know. So then, one. So okay. So what is? Uh, what we got Billy Douglas for in the tub because that was life changing. Come on, that was uh, the gay story yep. in the early yep. 1990s. And he was my age. Yeah, and I was so in love with him. How did that affect you? Oh my god, this was, was Ryan Philippe's character. Oh my god, so like yeah. imagine being so what was that 93? So I was 13, 14. Yeah. So just imagine being that age, and you see both sides of it. You see the hate and everything. You see, um, but then. Victoria Lord, at the time Victoria Lord, Riley Burke, Riley Buchanan, Buchanan, because she wasn't a carpenter yet, so, mm -hmm. um, stands up in church and like delivers a monologue on behalf of the gays. Mm -hmm. That's insane. Yeah. It's insane. They brought the AIDS quilt on in yeah. 93. It was so huge. It was so huge. Gary Donatelli, who became a dear friend of mine, who was one of the directors from the show, said it, the, he'll never forget the fan mail. Uh, how so many moms wrote letters saying, you know, like, I disowned my gay kid after seeing that, I, you know, it, we've, I've understood what, you know, it was such a big thing because people worshipped Vicky, right? Even though she was, had seven personalities and committed numerous homicides and crimes, but it wasn't her fault. It was her altar. Um, they worshipped, they saw her as like this pillar of hope and like what every housewife wanted to be. So now your idol is telling you you're wrong. Like... God doesn't hate anyone, like, we're blah, 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 you know? And then remember, uh, his father goes to lift his hand, he's gonna slap Billy, and Sloan grabs the hand, mm -hmm. because General Sloan Carpenter was brought on, who was the Reverend's father, whose son was gay and, and died of AIDS, and he disowned him, and he was there struggling with it, and they were putting the son's panel in the quilt. Mm -hmm. 
and he was watching what he did to his son happen again in front of his eyes between Billy and his father. And it was just so powerful when um, he went to, sl to hit Ryan Villapie and Sloan grabbed his hand. Mm -hmm. You know, it was huge. So Tom, we went from then in the early 90s, there were about, I think, 16 shows on the network television on yeah. a regular basis, five days a week. Yeah. We went from 16 to four, and actually right now there's three on network TV. Right, because they just, just went now. to streaming. Why do you, in your opinion, based on your understanding of the industry, why did that happen? Well, network television's over. And so I think the problem wasn't getting them off, it was not doing the right thing with them. Um, I love that All My Children Want Life to Live simultaneously share the record for the first program ever to go from television to streaming, which since yes. streaming is so huge, probably would have been a much better marketing idea to have it be Guiding Light. Because can you imagine if the first show to go from radio to television went to streaming? Can you imagine? Just what you could have done with that. With we the, really didn't have streaming capacity. We didn't. Passions, remember, Passions moved yeah. to um, Direct, Direct TV, TV which yeah. was a start. Yeah. But we, yeah, we were getting there. We were really getting there. Um, and, and I think people have to remember this was before Netflix. It was. It was. So, guiding I mean, before right Netflix. Before was Netflix. Popular. Yeah. And what Life to Live was not because you had yeah. Orange is the New Black and House of Cards. They were, were already starting, and Those were beginning. But they were beginning. Like the people were understanding yep. this idea of yep. streaming. So you, but you already had a streaming show, House of yeah. Cards, that was in Orange is the New Black that were sweeping the Emmys. True. Yes. And like you saw the writing on the wall. So it yes. was the time to get in. Yes. Get in cheap. So and get in to, the top. to revive All My Children and yes. One Life to Live yes. on um, the streaming Yes. Platform. And then so what they did was they did it. Um, Prospect, Park. Prospect Park licensed it, uh, had no concept of what it was to produce a soap. Uh, I'm not talking out of school, and you can read that anywhere. Those aren't my words I'm quoting. Um, because what we do know is, this is what we know as a fact. Every single day on Hulu and on iTunes, All My Children Will Life to Live, they would flip positions, were always the number one and number two most watched things on iTunes and Hulu. Yeah. So... Your goal is to have the number one show, right? So they have the number one show. What's the problem? Producing it badly was the problem. Um, they were insane with it. They didn't understand the audience. They wanted to reinvent the wheel. No one wanted the wheel reinvented. We just wanted our wheel. You had millions of us who loved this wheel. Just give us the wheel. No one wants to hear Vicky drop an F-bomb and the classy lady refused. Um, and, 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 and so, but it really wasn't viewership as much because the viewership was really picking up and they were starting to get their groove uh, by the end. I honestly thought so. I thought, um, I thought all my children felt a lot different than ABC, but I felt One Life to Live still kept the core of it. Mm -hmm. I thought the pilot was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Robin Strasser took me as her date to the opening, uh, which was like the most exciting night of my life. Um, and... <laughs> You know, they do the teaser and it starts with uh, Leia Fair and Vicky's getting the paper. Yeah. And if you listen to it, it's actually, it, it just feels like, oh, they're, they're going to get this. They're going to get this. Because they do a pastiche of the, uh, from the 80s, <laughs> like the everyone's favorite theme song. They did Jeffrey that, Osborne. They did, they did a pastiche of it. So as they're zooming into Land Fair, yeah. you hear a pastiche is, if you don't know, um, a pastiche is basically what you, it's not a parody, it's where you basically make a song sound like another song so you don't, if you don't have the rights to it. The Simpsons, every time The Simpsons does a musical thing, that's a, that sounds like something, that's a pastiche. So you see the pastiche of the 80s theme, and you're like, oh, they get us, it's Vicky. You see her engagement ring, and she just, and Clint hugs her, so you're back to love in the afternoon. That's a beautiful way to start. And, it's, yeah. and she just goes, it's gorgeous. Yeah. And you're just like, oh, we're back. And then the next thing you hear is Robin Strasser's voice just go, I'm back! And she has the portrait over her face and just pulls it down. The portrait. The portrait. Tell them what the portrait is. It's the portrait of Dorian Lord, which and is... And who has that portrait now? Actually, um, Robin has it back as of today. We brought it back to her today. She needed a little lift me up. But I have my own. So you had it. I had it until an hour ago. Okay, so again... For his story, it goes back history, and forth. It goes back. The and character forth. of Dorian had a very classic portrait, an oil portrait yep. that you had possession of. I have. We, it goes back and forth. Yeah. It lives between our houses. And now today, you're telling me that yep, Robin, has Robin has it. Okay. Okay. We'll go, we'll go back custody. Yeah. Yeah. How yeah. did you get to connect with Robin Strasser? Um, right. Um, it was actually right after the uh, cancellation was announced. Ironically, um, I saw on Playbill that there was a reading of something. 
starring Brooke Shields and Robin Strasser. And I'm a theater producer. And I wrote, blah, 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 um, this is who I am. I want front row seats. Like, reserve me front row. And they said, oh my god, of course. So I went, and you know, and then afterwards I introduced myself, and I was in the VIP seats, you know, you do that first, so. And uh, we talked for like an hour, she gave me her phone number, she's like, we have to have lunch this week. And yeah, we just became really close right away. Um, I was the one who, I, I can tell the story, I think I've told it publicly. Um, she, uh, she didn't have an agent after One Life to Live went off the air. Uh, we can literally go into that really has so much to do with why I did Melange, which I'm sure we'll talk about, but we can go into, this was before Grace and Frankie and Hacks and everything. And thank goodness Hollywood and the entertainment industry is understanding the value and worth of veteran actors and actresses, especially actresses. Uh, what they bring is just immeasurable. But anyhow, she didn't have an agent. So Christmas Eve, my phone rings. Uh, One Life to Live went off the air, actually on my 33rd birthday, January 13th, which I was like, of course it's my 33rd birthday. ABC has crucified us all. Jesus. Um, <laughs> I see the connection. I see where you're going. You got it, you got it, right? Yeah. Um, and now it's Christmas, and uh, it's been announced. It is going to happen. Uh, it's happening. Slay Zach is signed on. And Robin's been calling me, just saying, like, I don't know, I guess, I guess, I guess the train's going without Dorian, okay. And I was like, no, that's impossible, it can't happen. So my phone rings and it's uh, Jeff, Jeff Quats, what's his name from Prospect Park? The Jeff one. Oh, right, Jeff, there were two. So, um, it was Jeff, oh yeah, Merry Christmas, what other things? And he said, I, 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 I know who you are. Why are you calling me? I thought they wanted money, I was ready. I was like, I'll, I'll be a producer on One Life to Live. But he's like, this is gonna sound so weird. You're the only person that's been seen in public with Robin Strasser this year, but she seems to always be with you. Because she always was. She came to all my musical openings. She was, we were like, we were on red carpets together like 10 times that year, right? Uh, like, I was her date forever. It was, we, had, we had a ball. Um, you know, and she'd always dress to the nines, and you, you have to dress well when Dorian's on your own. You have to, because she is, you know, one of the world's true beauties. Um, and so I said, yeah, you know, we're doing this. We, we're desperate for Robin to do it, but we can't get a hold of her. Can you, can you put us in? I was like, she wants to do it. She wants to do it. Um, and so I was like, I'm going to call her right now. We're going to put this all together. Like, but I promise you, she wants to do it. Just treat her well and remember that she is the other star of the show. I was like, of course. I mean, you know, we're not claiming to be experts, but we know the show is Vicky Dory. And I was like, that's a great start. Say that to her. So I called Robin. I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Like, they called me, it was just a mistake. Oh, and she was like, oh, what? So fast forward to now two weeks later, one year after One Life to Live It Off the Air, um, I had a birthday breakfast, just me and Robin, and she signed her contract on my birthday because it would be it was the one oh year. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and she was oh brilliant on it. And then, so at the, um, at the premiere, I'm sitting next to her, she does the first scene. She's brilliant. Robin does not watch herself. She has seen very little of anything she has ever done, mm. ever. So she's very uncomfortable watching this in a room full of people. <laughs> it was the most Robin Strasser thing ever. She was brilliant in it, as anyone. And she's the best. She's literally one of Yale. I mean, she's genius. She's a genius actor. And so I just leaned over and went, brilliant as ever. And she just looked at me and went, well, I wish we had remembered to bring some M&M &M, M &M peanuts for snacking. <laughs> and, I was like, and then earlier she needed, she wanted a Diet Coke. And I was like, sit here, honey, I'll get you a Diet Coke. And I went, and they were just closing the bar. And I was like, excuse me, um, can I get a Diet Coke? They were closed. And I went, it's from Robin Strasser. She's like, I mean, she's the star of it. Like, uh -huh. she's literally like one of the main characters in the show. She really just wants a Diet Coke. And they're like, well, we're closed. And then and I was like, yeah, but it's for, and then Jerry, the great Jerry Verdurin is there, Clint Buchanan, who I loved Clint Ritchie, but to me, Jerry was the, the definitive Clint. I loved him so much and I loved him. I just got it. Like it made me get Clint. You know, I never loved the character. I loved Jerry's Clint. Um, and uh, he said, what's going on? And I was like, oh, I don't mean to make it seem like Robin really wants a Diet Coke and they won't give me one. And it's, Ro it's for Robin. He went, Robin wants a Diet Coke? Robin gets a Diet Coke, and he, like Clint Buchanan, just kicks the thing open and goes and just takes the Coke. I don't know. He was the best. They were all, they're all their characters. They wow. all have, Robin is Dorian. That was Clint. 
my best friend is Star Manning. She is yeah. Star. Yeah. Like, she's Star. I call her Star 60% of the time. Literally, she answers to Star. It's it's so fun. Yeah. Cassie isn't that player. I was gonna say, Cassie, Cassie's not player. who I know is, is or knew at a certain time, is one of the most non blair people. Yeah, she's journey. so gracious and sweet. Which not that Blair's not gracious, but she doesn't have you wouldn't yeah, like do you yeah. remember when they did that One Life Many Voices CD that Robin produced uh -huh. for Katrina? Uh -huh. And they did the uh they did a few songs at the Barnes and Noble of town uh -huh. by the studio and she was so shy with the mic. She was like, they don't want to hear it, you don't want to hear it. And I was like, of course we do, we want to hear it. Sing, you're Blair, sing. Like come on. Yeah. And that was uh, that was the best. Oh, I didn't know goodness. Robin yet like literally came up an escalator and she was just there and he went Oh my god, I love you! And she went, I love you too. <laughs> and the only other time I met her was at, um, I was 23, 24. It was a uh, ASPCA event at the Times Square Visitor Center and Robin Strasser and Rue McClanahan, who I ended up working with, oh, um, were like the two people there to like get you to adopt dogs. And I was like, <gasps> oh my god. Oh my god. Well, first off, I walk in and Rue McClanahan, Blanche Devereaux, is on the ground rolling around with the German Shepherd. And I was just like, what have I done to deserve this wonderful life I've been given? Oh my god. And I was doing a solo show at the time when I was still performing. And I just started it called Divas I've Done. And I had the wonderful privilege, very young, of being very good friends with Margaret Cho from my Providence Found days. When I was a naked boy, she was doing a show and we just... Uh, she came to see Naked Boy singing. It's a good story, I'm gonna tell you, it's two seconds. She comes to see Naked Boy singing. I don't know who she is. I'm a soap opera boy and a Broadway boy. I don't, I don't know. And, but all the queens in the cast, everyone's fawning over her, and I just took the photo, and I made a joke where they tried to move me, and I was like, Suzanne Summers, this is my bad side. So your mom had just come up, and she loved, she was like, ah! You know, okay. So I'm like packing up my shit, and she comes over, and she's like, why aren't you fawning over me, queen? And I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I don't know who you are. I'm told that you are very funny and very Asian, but I am unaware of you. And she was like, well, you know what I'm aware of? And she said this in front of the ball. She was like, you are the funniest in the show and we're going dancing right now. And I was like, okay, you seem cool. Wow. Then I really didn't know her because she was in a movie that I loved called It's My Party. Yes. Um, with Eric Roberts and, 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 and John and Michael Sharp yeah. from Falcon Crest yeah. Grover, who's now on General Hospital. And Olivia Newton-John, the yeah. best of the best of yeah. the best. Which oh is my a great god. movie about. Oh my god! AIDS, and, uh, one of the AIDS films. Oh my god! It's so good. Yeah. The talk about Bronson Pinchot, yeah. Lee Majors. It is so good. And you, yeah. it's one of those shows. Like, do you want to just cry? Watch it. Yeah. Like, you need to get something out. Just watch it. It's so good. Yeah. And I was like, oh my god, wait, you're in that movie. Oh my god, it's so good. Is Bronson Pinchot gay? And she was like, I mean, yeah, but no. But like, you know, um, so um, when I was doing my solo show, it was like my debut, and I was like. I was really good friends with Margaret and Heather Matarazzo. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. So they both gave me quotes for my flyer. Uh, Margaret, wrote, Margaret said, Tom Dangora is brilliant. And Heather wrote, nobody tops Tom Dangora. Little did you know. Um, That's not the reputation I heard. You saw okay. part of it. Yeah. <laughs> new butt. I have a new butt. As we covered in part one. Can't help that. New butt. Um, so um, so, uh, oh, wow. so I, I see Rue McClanahan. And I'm like, oh my god! Like, so we talk, and she's telling me about it, and she's so kind, and she's so fabulous. And I was like, this is so crazy, but like, you've been so nice. Why not even ask? Like, you know, starve people, uh, uh, shy people starve, shy people starve. So you gotta ask. Um, so I was like, you know, I'm doing this show, and uh, Heather Matarazzo, who's in the Women with You on Broadway last year, she's my good good friend, and she did this, and you know, who Margaret Cho is, and she was like, oh, I love them. Of and she was like, well, yeah, of course I'll give you a quote. I want to help a young performer, but it has to be good. Let's think. Okay, okay. And I'm like, I can't believe this is happening to me. It's Blanche Devereaux. And she was like, um, okay, okay. Tom is so one. No, that won't do. Uh, and then, Tom is great. No, no, no. I got it. The world needs more Tom Dangoras in it. Is that good? And she let me put, she just met me for three minutes. She let me put it on my postcard. So then I get a quote from Rue McClanahan, a photo of McClanahan, she leaves, fucking Dorian Lord walks in, and it's like, oh, and she looked so Dorian, she was like, looked so Dorian. So like, she, she had that, it was when Dorian was doing the up, the up suite, you know? Yeah. And she was wearing this like flawless red suit, it was just so perfect. And she like, picks up these two dogs and she's like, this is perfect for you and your handsome boyfriend. And if you adopt them, you can come to the studio and walk them during lunch with me and Scooter at the park. And I was like, application now. I can't find the photo. There's a photo. I sent it to my mom. She can't find it either. 
because it was before digital. I cannot find the photo anywhere. The first photo of me and Robin. Now there's been 20,000 and I, I can't find it. And then um, three years later, four years later, I brought Brutal Province down and produced uh, a, a Night with Ruby Clinton on there. And I got to spend a whole weekend with her right before she passed away. And it was one of the best weekends of my life. And she was everything you'd want to be. She was the best. So fun. There's so much, so much. How does one It's a blessed become, life. It's a blessed life. How does one become a producer of a show like that? How does one work with Rue and say, hey, I want to produce your show. Let's go to Pizza. Yeah, um, well, it started with, I did a, I did the one, the solo show. It was uh-huh. called Divas I've Done. It was about my obsession uh-huh. with those random people. Uh-huh. You know, Dorian was in, it was my Dorian. At the time, it was about like how much I loved like Broadway understudies and stuff, which I still do. Um, but like how I would just become obsessed with someone's talent, you know, um, random people. And I ended up working with everyone except Princess Diana because she was dead. Um, but I ended up everyone that I ever had in the show. I actually have ended up working with. Wow. Well, I guess not Liza Minnelli. I guess they're still not yet. Well, I mean, to just see the Oscars, probably done. Um, but we love her so much. But yeah, so it was um, that was so. The show it was supposed to be two nights at Don't Tell Mama. I ended up doing it for two years all over the country, playing giant theaters off Broadway, selling out for two years, rave reviews, um, and it like. It was like a mega hit, and but I self-produced it, and then I kind of realized, is it my talent or is it my producing skills? And so I thought, well, I think I'm just gonna take myself out of the equation and see if I can do it without me being the product. And then this way, when it's showtime, instead of working my butt off, I can sit at the back of the theater with a glass of champagne and yell things. So I did that. So I did a Christmas show with Ellen Green. Um, Marla Scheffel, who was Jane Eyre, Jane Eyre the musical, one of my, still my favorites of all time, Maya Days, she's in Melange, she was Aida, and uh, had that huge gay dance song that was yeah. like, what she gonna look like yeah. with that chimney on her? Um, and Kelly Breyer was in it, and then the great Christine Petty. And um, it was very well received, it was, it was very stunning. Me and my husband, uh, we were the youngest producers in Manhattan at the time with a major commercial <laughs> production open, and it kind of catapulted everything. And- Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's how it started, uh, 2005. And then how did that lead to Melange? Let's talk about Melange. So Melange was that. many years later. Melange was my therapy post-election. I had had the idea forever. Uh, and, and finally Michael's like, just write it. Like, you're just miserable. You're laying in bed. Like, do something. Write it. Write it. Mm-hmm. This, your idea, like, you have, you have, like, a season of ideas. Just write a pilot. Just start writing. And so I did. And I wrote a pilot. And then I asked Eileen, Kristen, and Gary to tell you to read it. And... And I said, you know, I wrote a role for Eileen. I don't expect anything. Um, I wrote some. I wrote the lead for Morgan Fairchild. I wrote a role for Mega Days. Uh, I wrote a role for Eileen. I wrote a role for Kristen Alderson um, and a couple other people. And so um, they read the pilot. I was like, I don't know. And Gary was like, Well, I'm not like you know. It's just there's so many digital shows, and I've been asked to direct them all. And I think it's just best for me not to. So, but he read it and said, no, I'm directing this. This is, this is not a, this isn't a digital show. Like, this is a network show. Like, this is crazy. And I think it was like, what the fuck is this, Tom? And it was so cool. And, um, and so we decided to put a pilot together and, um, we didn't have a lot of money. And I said, and I didn't, did not know Morgan Fairchild. I'd never met her. And I just loved her my whole life. I loved the city. I don't care what anyone says. It was great. Um, the show, the city. The city. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The Morgan Fairchild yeah, started. Yeah. She entered by helicopter. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so I call her manager at the time. Who, I don't know, she, she's not with anymore. And the manager was like, well, Thomas is no money. And I was like, I know, I know. I mean, it wasn't bad, but like it wasn't network money, but it was, it was grateful money. It was like appreciative of her star, uh-huh. like, but still not like great, you know? And she said, all right, well, uh, you know what? You're so nice. And uh, she had also worked with Latoya Jackson, who I'm friends with. And she was like, you know, and Latoya loves you, so like, I'll make sure Morgan reads the script. Like, give us, give us a week or so, you know. And so, and this was um, maybe on Friday at like six p.m. Wow. that I talked. And I said, okay, no, thank you. I really appreciate that. Nine p.m. that same night, I get a message from a Morgan Fairchild. You wrote this just for me. Oh, I'm doing this. Like, you, I know this. What did that feel like? Amazing. Oh my God. And she's been the kind. She's been the best. I, I mean, my friends at Morgan Fairchild. It's insane. And she was so good. Uh, let me tell you something. It was, we filmed so quickly. We did um, 42 pages in seven locations in four eight-hour days. It was 98 degrees. The air conditioner was broken. Morgan enters in a full-length mink and was so laser-focused that she did it all in one take. Wow. 
And then I, I said to her, you know, Morgan, it's just, it's like a master class. Like, how did you, do? we were all dying. Like we were so, we were behind, you we were sitting cooking for hours. Like, how did you just laser focus like that and just knock it out? It was a four page monologue. And she went, well, honey, you know, in the seventies, I studied Kung Fu and I found my chi. The greatest thing you've ever heard no. in your life. I would not have expected that yeah. answer. Yeah. But Eileen did it and to perfection. If it ever happened, yes. it would have been an Emmy. It would have yes. been an Emmy for her. She was ever she was everyone's favorite. Kristen did it, but you only see her for a second. But what I had planned for her was it was you don't know. I'll send you the scripts if you want. Uh -huh. That pilot was nothing. It like what happens, I was so excited to do. Like shit hits the fan wow. in every way. I had two seasons done and a third season planned. Like it was nuts. Is there any hope it might still? I'm, I'm trying. Look, you know, um, we were very blessed that uh, uh, Logo had interest in it, but it was kind of a victim of the pandemic. And we did um, during the pandemic. Logo premiered the pilot on their uh, YouTube channel, yeah. and it was it was really successful. We got a hundred thousand views. For the and uh, the comments, I thought they were shilling. I had to call Viacom the next day and go, "Look, it's very important to me as a writer to hear criticisms of my work. I, I, you know, I've been through enough. I can take it." Nope, it, people loved it. They loved it. Loved it, and everyone loved it. And the actors like it was the people we got was cr it was crazy. Anne Ramsay, but she got the script. Like, come on, she literally went from filming Milan to filming the reboot of Mad About You in a lead wow. role. You know, I mean, she's wow. Lisa from Mad About You. Um, and, she, and like League of Their Own, come on, like it's just so wild. It blew my, uh, when Darnell Williams said yes, I had a stroke. I wrote it for him, but I never in a million years thought, I mean, God, he's a genius, right? Um, but Robert it, Newman. Robert Newman. Newman. We just, I just adore Oh my God, yeah. I, I did think he was gay because he was yeah. so into, because he was so handsome at his age and into musical theater. So when I found out he was straight, I was like, oh God, am I going to get canceled for this? He's so liberal. I need to be able to get away with this. Come on, he's so liberal and so on her side. Please, no one cancel me for casting a straight he's man amazing. in the role. He's amazing. He's amazing. And he's so with us. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But no, you get in trouble for that now. Yeah. For casting a straight guy in a gay yeah. role. So that mean I can never play straight if I was an actor again? It's uh, it's good. I I, no, I think it's clear. It's gonna bite us. We don't believe it's gonna bite us in the ass. It's gonna blow up yeah. in our face. It's gonna yeah. It's, there are, it's gonna take roles away. Not give us roles. More glass. No, I understand yeah. uh, diversifying, which was my biggest goal of Melange, and doing it on no budget is really hard. Um, when you you know, but my all I wanted was it. I said just please let it be a token free zone. Yeah. I didn't want you to ever say oh the Latino char character. The black character that you know what I mean. Right. I wanted I wanted it to be a melange. That was that's what it was. Right. And I didn't. And I also wanted because it took place in a gay bar. I wanted to also take um, that out of the out of our community too. The discrimination. Right. You know, we had Alex Newell playing uh, the gender fluid role. Yes. And it was very important to me because he's larger and uh, and I, peer, I paired it with a brilliant Mark and Delicado. Who we from learned, Lauren Betty. Yeah, who we learned in the, at the end of the pilot was an escort and I was, yeah. was doing it to pay for medical school and I'm so pro-sex work yeah. in a safe way and I wanted to tell that story where I wanted to dec I wanted to take the stigma out of it and say, okay, so what happens yeah. if you're disowned and you have to, you literally are 18, 19, you have nothing in the world but a dream, you're left alone to pay for your $120,000 dream, you're gorgeous, and you know, older wealthy gentlemen are willing to pay your tuition and pay your this and that. What are you gonna do? Right. So if people want to see the series, is it still on the logo website? Can people uh, still see no, it? it's not. Um, oh, is there any way people can see it? Not this? at the moment. I am still working on it. We we hit a little roadblock with a nefarious character who, you know, misrepresented himself, but more on that later. But it's like a real soap opera, but um I mean in the end the good guys always win. So I'm ultimately, I hope we can get to see that. Yeah, so, I have a great idea for a second series that I'm working on right now. Is it? Um, it's 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 young. It's a younger series, uh -huh. and it um it has to do with religious oppression of gay of gay uh -huh. kids. But it has room for all of our favorites in it. It's going to be super soapy, and it's also going to like um it's also going to focus on what we know if you're say over thirty five and gay. 
that there was something very erotic, very sexy about engaging in taboo activity. Mm -hmm. So um, it's also going to very much mean, focus like, like when when the sex, just or just gay sex back uh, then. Yeah, we were told we were we were gross, like right. we were we were abominations. Yeah. So Margaret Cho used to have a thing in her act, you know. So when gay men fuck. They have no choice but to kick up their heels and fuck. And then she would go, and it's so inspiring to watch. Like, you know, but it was true. You're just told, no, 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 no. Yeah. You're bad, you're bad. But it's what your natural inclination is. When you do it, you just can't help but like really revel in it. You know, since Will and Grace, I feel like it's gotten a little less hot. We're now that we're allowed. It's, yeah, gay sex is a little less stigmatized. It is. Actually, there's a new movie called Bros. Yeah. That, that kind of makes jokes about the fact that we're so mainstream now. It sort of like takes some of the fun out of fucking. It's yeah, like, so through yeah. Uh, recent experiences and yeah. recent people that I've met and gotten close with, and I've learned a lot about what is happening uh -huh. in uh, religious areas uh -huh. and how younger gay, especially gay men, are treated. Um, I've also learned about like what the underground sex is like there still. Ooh. And I and everything I was hearing, I thought, all right, two opportunities here. One, expose this shit, get a dialogue going, make real change. But what does that better than anything? Wrapping it up in drama and sex. It's yeah. a soap opera. Well, and hey, if any of those characters need to go to therapy. Oh, I'm ready. And need a wiser, older therapist. Yes, it's, it's you. It's you. Them. It's you. You're, no, you're also going to have to be yeah. on it to advise. So, like, it's not wrong. Okay. Um, <laughs> Deal. I will be there. But, um, of course, our bigoted dean will be played by Morgan Fairchild. Of course. I'm, I'm writing that oh, for yeah. her. Of course. Of course. Of course. Good. And Kristen as a bigot's going to be oh, great. That is sounding good. So, let's now just think about, as all of this was happening, Melange was being filmed, everything was going in that direction, and then 2020 COVID hit. Yeah. You had been working on Off-Broadway, you had been producing Broadway shows, you had produce, producing Rue McLeod. Well, Rue I mean, you had been doing a lot of earlier, but, yeah. <laughs> but then COVID, for the first yeah. time in history, stopped Broadway. The show did not go on. It did not go on. And I didn't believe it. I'm telling you, I was running errands. Like, thinking, oh, it's going to be two, what, it's going to be a day, two days. What, oh, well, we thought a couple weeks, right? To, we to, thought two or three weeks. When they said four weeks, I said, it'll be back by Monday. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. Then it, but because we weren't given right information, like, information was not coming out correctly, right. you know? Right. Well, the, I, I do think it's a novel virus. So some of that, I think, from a public health standpoint, we simply didn't know. Right. But I'm sorry, when we were being advised to go into the supermarket and wear gloves, no, that's, that's, that's because they didn't have masks to give us, and they just didn't want to tell us. Yeah, see, and I never touch vegetables anyway. Yeah. No, so cover, just, yeah. they could have said cover your face. Yeah. Just cover your face, man. Right. Wrap, wrap your, under, put your underwear on your face, anything. Just cover your right. face. No, it was, yeah, just, you're fine, just wear rubber boots. No, we weren't fine. So meanwhile, because you live in that area, yeah. you saw certain things happening in the Broadway world that the rest of us weren't seeing. Yeah. Let's talk about what was it you saw and how did you decide to step up? Well, um, you know, at the end of 2020 and things were coming back a little, uh, they were doing the outdoor dining, but n none of the restaurants or anybody was were making ends meet. And so I was, I was at the chiropractor, I'll never forget it, I'm getting my neck done. And my phone keeps ringing. I was like, I should take this, like it keeps ringing. And it was my neighbor, Marie, and she said, oh my God, oh my God. West Bank Cafe is going to close on Sunday for good. I was like, what are you, no, what are you talking about? They can't. It, it, it been open since 19, it's been open since 1978. It's where we all go. It's literally where... Or it's where you and I had had dinner. We did, yeah. 42nd and 9th. Yep, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's, where, it's where we go. Yeah. It's where we go. Um, and there's a theater downstairs as well, a 100-seat theater called the Lori Beachman yeah, Theater. Yeah, it's where Joan Rivers did her last show. Yep. And with... tested all of her material. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it really is. It's, 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 and the same man has owned it the whole time, Steve Olson, who had become a very good friend of mine. And he was very known for befriend, befriending everyone and making everyone feel important. You know, it could be me or it could be Al Pacino, and we'd be both treated like stars. You know, so I went in and said, hey, what, you know, I hear you're closing. How bad is it? And he's like, it's worse than you can imagine. It's, it's over. And I go, what do you mean? There's no such thing as over. Like, what is the problem? And he said, I don't come up with, a, you know, maybe $250,000 by New Year's. Like, there's nothing I can do. We're so behind. And I said, $250,000 yep. by New Year's. And, and, and it was, this was uh, December 11th. Of 2020. 
Mm. And I said, I right. looked at Michael and I said, okay, well then we're gonna raise, we're gonna raise it. That's what we're gonna do, we're gonna figure it out. And it, it, well, how are you gonna do that? I said, well, I'm gonna call, this, I'm gonna call my friends in politics, I'm gonna fig, we're gonna figure this out. Maybe we'll do an event, we're gonna figure it out. But at the same time, there was uh, someone who had become very important in my life, just picking up his chicken enchiladas at the time, take out, because he was filming a Netflix series that we now know as Inventing Anna. So good. And this man was the fabulous Tim Guinea who plays uh, the editor that Anna Klumski is fighting with on Inventing Anna. And he's the brother on the staircase. So he did these two massive things while we were doing all this. And he said, I want in, gave me his number. He's like, let's do this together. I didn't even know who he was, but when someone walks up and says, let's do this, and you're doing a hopeless cause, to you say, thank you. That's what you do when you're trying to, you know, it takes a village. Um, so yeah. we, we, me and Michael go to Target. We finish walking the dogs. And Michael goes, what about a telethon? What about an old-fashioned Christmas Day telethon? I was like, honey, that Christmas is in 14 days. And he's like, yeah, we can do it. I, said, yeah, I guess we can do it. So we call Tim and say, we're going to do a telethon. And Tim's like, great. I already have uh, Manny Patinkin and Alan Cumming interested. And it's great. Um, and so we just, it snowballed into a 10-hour thing with everyone. Deborah Messing, Nathan Lane, Matthew Broderick, everything. We raised $400,000. They named a pork chop after me. And we saved the venue. This is incredible. So and again, I just, the fact that you recognized there was a problem and this was in the end of 2020 so we weren't meeting in person <gasps> that was not done. Right, that's all right you can do that you can do that. um puzzle top <laughs> so you recognize that a there was a problem and b there was a viable solution because everything was yeah, virtual and, and look and my head was spinning because i literally at that point had lost everything i was i was 11 months behind in rent no income and when the pandemic happened i said okay i'm gonna do what i can I emptied my bank account and I made sure I paid everyone that had a face, if that makes sense. Mm. If you were a credit card company, go fuck yourself. You come, and my credit score is 524 now because of it. But if you were a person that had to eat and I owed you anything, I don't care if I had to sell my blood, you were getting that money. So we drained our accounts to make sure, you know, if you weren't a multi billion dollar conglomerate and we owed you money, you got it that day and weren't worried about us, right? Um, so I was very disappointed that it took, I mean, it took two people that were like, couldn't pay their rent and were negative in the bank to do this when there were so many rich, great people. So that important, that to me is important as well. It bothers two me, it still bothers me to this day. who were struggling to make ends meet were the ones who ended up saving this, this and Broadway I spent, institution. And I, we probably, we had no money. We probably spent thousands on each one because we, I, bu- I had to buy, I had to buy cameras. I had to buy sound equipment. Uh, There was so much, I had to, I wanted to make sure people felt comfortable when they came in to film with us. So we bought all the COVID stuff. It was really insane. Because then we immediately uh, got a call from Birdland saying, you know, we're in the same So after, after, so that's what was amazing to me. So after this successful telethon on Christmas Day of 2020, which saved a New York institution, the next thing that happened at Birdland. I got a call the 26th, the day after Christmas. Hey, you know, we're in the same thing. And I went, oh my God, you gotta let me sleep for one day. We were gonna go have prime rib with Steve and Janet, who owned uh, the West Bank. It was so good. The prime was so good. They're prime. Oh my God. They had- what about your own pork chop? Don't you eat your own pork chop? Oh, actually, that wasn't there yet. Okay. But there's the prime rib. Now there's a pork chop. Not right at the moment. It, it came back. That was my okay. one thing. I said, I said, now that I say, he said, now that you say West Bank, what do you want? I said, I want the pork chop back. Bring it back. <laughs> And he said, bring it back, I'll name it after you. And it was uh, Tom's 10 ounce pork chop. So then Birdland came um, and we talked to them and said, oh no, this will, we got this. Uh, so we did another telephone, we did, a, we did a special. It was a four, almost a four hour special. That was so great. It opened with Bill Clinton, you know, telling the, the importance of jazz and Charlie Parker's legacy, <laughs> you know, in the Birdland. And then ended with Whoopi Goldberg. And in between we had every amazing performer in the world. It was. Not of this earth. How was, did you get all these people? Shy people starve. You ask them. And this is what I said. And every and The press ever kept... It was a great press. Like, it was so much... People Magazine called me a powerhouse. Uh, but people kept asking the same question. Like, well, how can you even do that? And I said, well, look. We are literally staring at the largest forest fire we've ever seen. And we're all just holding one bucket of water. And we're, we, everyone wants to help, but no one knows how to help. So all I'm doing is getting 500 people together with their buckets and putting out the fire in one tree. And now we've all done something together. 
Now, instead of sitting here watching Tiger King, you know, raising yeast. I feel so attacked. <laughs> I did it too, but it was gross. Lowest common denominator. Um, like, we're doing something. We're, we're helping our people. And yeah. then uh, then we moved right on to the York Theater, which wasn't only, they were actually doing a really good job being very innovative with uh, doing virtual stuff. And, and they were really working their butts off. And then a pipe burst. So now they were dealing with the pandemic and their entire theater that they've been in for decades was ruined. Gone. I mean, gone. Ruined. Underwater. City does nothing. Could have had a woman there. Um, no, but it was really, it was horrifying because they actually were really staying, no pun intended, afloat. And then they were hit with, you know, it's like, come on, what else? So, so we did, they had a show. Michael actually, his first professional job in New York was as the artistic director, Jim Morgan's yes. assistant. Yeah, my husband. And uh, so, and they'd always been so good to us. And we got to jump in their family. And this is a theater that's been around for almost 50 years. And the only theater dedicated to developing new musicals. Cannot lose this. They had a hit show about 20 years ago uh, that Michael would, Michael was working there and I had a promotions company at the time and they hired me and we loved it called The Musical of the Musical, the Musical, the Musical uh -huh. which takes the same scenario done five times in the style, pastiches as we explained earlier, of five different composers. And I had the idea, let's, it's usually a cast of four that does the whole thing. I said, instead of that, let's do a cast of 16 stars so everyone just has a little thing to do and they'll be all stars. And the stage direction, we can get mega stars to read as narrators. And then, in since there's, uh, it's done several times. In between, we'll do mini telethons, like you know, money asks. So it, um, it was epic. Um, we got uh, Patty Lapone, Bernadette Peters, Betty Buckley, the great Henri De Shields, who helped us with so many of them. Hillary Clinton closed it with like a, an address that theater is coming back, and she'll be there in the front row clapping and. Um, and you Julianne and Moore. Did all these people. You got all these Yeah, guys. and so did Tim, me, Michael, and Tim Guinea again. And of course, always the venues were on board. You know, Birdland, they're all Jim Caruso, Susie Mosher, the uh, longtime owner, Johnny Valenti, you're calling all their friends. Uh, it takes a village. You're calling friends of a friend. I became dear friends with my district leader, Mar uh, Marisa Redanti, who jumped in head first on day one and did, didn't sleep a wink through the whole thing, just helping, helping, helping. Senator Brad Hoyleman, who is one of the greatest public servants we have in the state and a dear friend of mine, um, was there for anything we needed, whether it be to go after the landlords for threatening these establishments, you know, and uh, yeah, and so I think we raised 1.5 million total and it was the, it was West Bank, Birdland, the York Theater, the Labyrinth Theater, uh, Stonewall, we did a big thing for Stonewall in Gives Back Initiative, they're an amazing charity. I did a couple of campaigns in between, since I was on a roll, and did a couple of things for a couple of candidates I believed in. And then uh, the Theater World Awards, which is the oldest award in theater history that uh, awards debuts, and it's a not-for-profit, they were sinking. Uh -huh. so, uh, so we did, um, we, that was the last one we did, where we did a like a tribute to the Theater World Awards to raise some money. And then we actually, actually, Michael, they asked me and Michael to direct the live show this year, which was fabulous, which was so fun. Oh my God. Yeah, okay. so that was that. So people want to know why this is a two-part episode with this amazing guy. This is a... You we haven't talked about Barry Manilow. A bit, so, so that's the last, that's what I want to go with at the end. My true love. But again, as you said, we were all metaphorically staring at the forest fire at the end of 2020, all standing there with their butt thinking, what can I do? What yeah. can I do? Not knowing what we can do, you organized and made it possible for people to join collectively to bail out and help keep these institutions of theater and art and creativity alive. And you know what? You, I, you, yeah, you but, did that. But I think what I, I think that what I really learned was, is because I kept at the beginning, I kept saying this, like, why? There are people that could do this without blinking. Like, why do I have to work, me and Michael have to work 20 hours a day on this? Like, why? Like, why do we have to spend the final two pennies we have? Like, why don't we? Like, why Why can't someone, someone one check, they wouldn't even blink. And it kind of hit me, you know what? It's because they don't understand what it feels like to go to bed worried. Um, you know, I, I've, been, I've had a, an amazing career, so blessed, like so many dreams have come true. But at the end of the day, I'm an independent theater producer that really loves 
the fringe of it all that loves off-Broadway, that loves comedy. And I love the challenges and I love the weird small shows that are always financial challenges. And so I, you know, and I grew up with nothing. So I've gone to bed always nervous, always looking at the spreadsheets, always like, how am I going to do it? How am I going to do it? And then so the, I, for me, our stuff was already closed. So we already dealt with that, Ugh, you know, and it, it wasn't about coming back or not at that point for us. It was just living through the moment. But these are people that uh, their restaurants were running, like you could, they could have their 10% capacity or whatever it was. And so I just kept thinking about the night. Anytime I go to bed, I thought about what Steve, the owner of West Bank, what was going on in his chest as he laid in bed right there. And I knew it. It was the most familiar foreboding to me. Or Johnny, who, you know, had Birdland for so many decades, like worked his whole life. And because of something that had nothing to do with him, so out of his control, he is sitting there, forget everything else that's going on, going to lose everything. And just, I think it's just knowing just how just horrible and sometimes helpless that feels. And honestly, no, no one ever, like, no one was like that nobody helps you. That, you know, nobody cares. You have felt that. Every day, this morning, nobody cares. So, like, you know, you have to, like, you have to be the change that you wish to see. And and you you have two choices. Well, you have many choices. But for me, I could sit and just complain and just say, you know, well, no one helps me. Why should help anyone? Or I could lead by example and say, like, this is what I believe the world should be like. It would be great. If it came back around for me, if it doesn't, I'm not, at least I'm not going to be a hypocrite. Like I'm going to do what I believe should happen. Even if it doesn't happen for me, it's okay. Like at least I put it out there. That's incredible. That's, you know. That's incredible. No, it was really, but it was this also it was magic. magic. But it was magic. This it was why I learned from you. I feel like we got more out of that than they got. Because it was just. Well, I think it's a win-win. Kept us busy. Yeah. We met some of the greatest people. In the, I'm friends with Andre DeShields. One of the greatest talents that have ever he existed. Is. You know, he might. Oh, wait, wait. He's so cool. Oh. Like, he's so cool. Yeah. Like, we would do a great interview. Oh, he's yeah. so cool. Yeah. He's the most yeah. game amazing man alive. So speaking of projects and fulfillment, yeah. we're a little running out of time, but I want to hear about what's next for you and Barry Manilow. Oh my God. So, um, my life my obsession Barry Manilow. with Barry Manilow has come full circle because I'm one of the co-producers of his unbelievable musical harmony that had the most amazing sold-out runoff Broadway this uh, spring and is moving to Broadway in 2023. Now, this is a musical, like a, 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 sh- a fictional show, or this yes, is like it, a, it a is, review of his life? It is or? not. It is not a jukebox musical. It's an original musical written by Barry Manilow and the amazing Bruce Sussman, who is his longtime best friend and lyricist. It is a, a true story of a group from the uh, 20s and 30s called the Comedian Harmonists in Germany, who were like Beatles big, like the biggest thing in America. Three of them are Jewish and Hitler had them erased. That's the short of it. Basically the elevator pitch is, it's Jersey Boys meets Cabaret. Act one is Jersey Boys, you see the amazing come to Jesus, you know, not, well, come to fame moment where, yeah. you know, you're watching them like become the biggest things and then act two, the shit hits a fan and Hitler happened. You know, it's, it's insane. The New York Times called it defiantly classic. It's so good. It's just a perfect old fashioned musical. It's unbelievable. It's, I think it's the best thing I've ever seen in my life. And if I didn't worship Barry Manilow, it would still be my favorite musical I've ever seen. So you, what's he like? Oh, what is it like? I see, know? Yeah, it's wild. So it's, uh, there was a, a cocktail party for uh, the producers of the show. And uh, it was an amazing thing to watch Barry Manilow's reaction to see me and kind of, he, you could see him put it together. Wait, you're the guy from the front row. Oh, like, and he just went, you're everywhere. I know. <laughs> he gets around. You know, uh, yeah. Um, no, it's, it's, been, it's been wild. Uh, it's so crazy. It's so surreal. Um, I've, like, I've loved him my whole life. He's my, I, he's my favorite living artist. Um, I've, I've seen him 32 times live this year alone. So I've seen a lot of your I love it so much. Vegas. Vegas. Like, look, during the pandemic, I just decided I'm, I'm, I'm not going to just like once. I'm, no, I'm going to savor everything I love. He's 79 years old. I got petrified. I was never going to see him live again. So why once a year? Why? Yeah. Why when I'm in Vegas and he's there? Why don't I just pop over? Yeah. Forget I love it. the word savor. I use that all the yeah. time. Yeah. It's a yeah. savor. Yeah. Pleasure. No, yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to drown yeah. in the pleasure. And that's my whole year, and I'm a little exhausted from it, but I did everything I said I would do a year ago. I 
drowned in fun. I made sure like everything that I put aside before the pandemic I did. I don't know if that's a thing and maybe we'll ex someone will explore it, but maybe there's like a, a party post, like a, P a PTSD. Like I've overlived in the last year. I'm actually really tired, but it's been amazing. And um, he's been an amazing part of it. Wow. And he gets it. Like he got, yeah, I was there for his reopening last week. He, he broke the staging and held my hand and sang daybreak to me. I could die happy. All right, that's beautiful. That is a beautiful moment. It's harmony. I got to bring my dad to the show in Boston, and my dad's the reason I love him, because when I was young and got bullied, he played I Made It Through the Rain. I was like, this is our anthem. My dad's gay and fabulous. And like, he's like, this is the family anthem. You, you know, you rise above the crowds and start your own parade. Yeah. So I got to, like, I got to sit in the fourth row of the Boston Garden and watch Barry, and bring Barry, my dad to Barry Manila for Father's Day. That was his Father's Day. Here. He had taken you as a kid or you just took him as a No, he had never been live. Oh, he just okay. loved him. Oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah, that it's is great. beautiful. It's that, really great. That is a whole other area. So here's the thing. We're about at the end, but I think we just have to make sure that another time yeah. we come back and do Absolutely. a part three. Done. I love talking with you. And here's what I'm really getting from these conversations. There's so many things that you that you are inspired to do. I want to. I don't say motivated because it's not like oh, there's someone saying that these are things you should do. These are things you wake up in the morning and decide, this yeah. is how I'm going to help. This That's is it. how I'm going to connect. This is how I'm going to reach people. This is how I'm going to fight to make the world a better place and how I have had to deal with it. And 100%. That's that all you can do. So much. But we're still, like, it's also, you are perfectly imperfect. You can, like, you can do great things. I'm a mess. Like, I'm still an absolute train wreck. Me, I'm still but... so tortured. Like, there's still so, there's still so much baggage. But like that doesn't mean that has to define you and you can't step beyond that and still put your best foot forward and still do your best to make a difference. And you know, and at the end of the day, when you're when it all wash comes out in the wash, you know, maybe if you did as many good things as you can, the good will outweigh the bad in your legacy. Because at the end we only have a legacy. You know, Princess Diana, still yeah. talking about her. Yeah. The queen can't die without all without it being all about Diana. You know why? She was a great person. Yeah. There were flaws, I guess. Yeah. There was there's a lot, but what we remember is that she had everyone's best interest at heart. And you know, and she wanted to help people. And closer to home, I do think about Jerry Bergarn. Oh who, yeah. Who who people don't know that, you know, within that world, he was such an influence on soap fans for 40 years. And because he had had um, cancer, he had had anal cancer, and he was so open on that journey. Yeah. He encouraged yeah. so many straight men right. to right. get pap smears yep. Yep. over their lifetime to try to prevent anal cancer yep. in straight men because of his act. Yeah, 100%. And, yeah, those are the, you and Jerry, and these are the people I look to. It's like, you just gotta, you know, step it up. You just do what you can. A little bit. It makes a difference. If you could go back to Tom watching Ryan's Hope and the ABC lineup with your grandmother... And give that Tom one piece of advice or guidance or wisdom. What would that be? Put the Doritos down, kid. It's not worth it. <laughs> no, you know, look, I don't know. Like, I was so encouraged to be myself. I don't know what I'd change. I don't know. Um, it would have been nice to know that I was that would be friends with Dorian. And that, like, things would, you know, it is. It's, it's, it's my, I don't know. Give yourself a break, maybe. I mean, I just was, I don't know. Be kind. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I had a, I had a real bully back phase that I regret deeply. Mm -hmm. It's why I'm so close with Perez Hilton. I understand where that phase came from from him. Yeah. We were both so bullied, and in our early 20s, we had the same reaction where we said, well, we'll take the power back, and we'll make you cry. I regret that deeply. I mean, it was part of my journey. I don't know. Maybe I needed that for empathy, but I do. There was some, I was mean to some people, and I hate it. But um, it is what it is. You know, no time machines. Hot tub time machine, though. We can do that next time. All right. Well, thank you. All right. Thank you for everything you do. Oh, we also talk goodness. like this. Like, you don't change the world on a daily basis. Please. I'm just here to have tubs with amazing people. And oh, you how are... many times have you taken a walk with me? Because I'm not. I'm like, oh. Need to check in. Well, we're in this together. And yeah. like you said, it's like it's having that bucket. And we can have an impact with one bucket. But we have so much more of an impact when we put our buckets together. That's oh, right. I like that. Yeah, I think yeah. that's sweet and sounds kind of dirty. So I like it. I'm going to remember that. Okay, it's, it's like, let's keep our buckets close. That's how we roll. <laughs> Community. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank buddy. you for taking time Always. to speak with me. Thank you for helping me at various points in these last oh, 10 years. Thank it's always a good day when I see you. 
That means a lot. Thank you for helping our world with your service, oh. with your political service, with your artistic service, with your financial service, and all the fundraisers for Broadway and everything you did for Hillary Clinton. It's been an honor. And you exemplify my intuitive sense of why we're here. Like, I don't always know exactly why we're here in, in a spiritual sense. I just know something in me says, you're here to make the fucked up world you're in a little better than how you found it. That's and all, as that's long all as you're you doing do. something every day. That's all you can do. Even if it's one person, yeah. that's all you can do. Yeah. That's what keeps me going throughout all this. My other practice. new thing that we're going, yeah. practice this. Um, if you think something nice, just say it. I walk, people will look at you like you're nuts, but I'll walk by someone that looks, a woman or something that looks like they're having a terrible day. I'm like, those glasses are stunning on you. And then, what? What? Say it. Yeah. It's been doing it for the last year. It's huge. Just any, yeah. if something, if a positive thing pops in your head, just speak it out loud and immediately. It'll throw them off guard, but they really want to hear it, I think, and they'll carry it with them. And New Yorkers are effusive. I mean, despite, you know, like, we are nice people. Yes. It's like, I love hearing nice things. Yes. I love saying Yes, nice yes. Yeah. So I do it. That's my new thing. Yeah. It's a thing. Okay. I can end on that. <sighs> love that. All right, everybody. If you like this interview, please subscribe. Yes. Uh, subscribe to this series. We have an entire first season of episodes, and now we're in the second season talking about these issues of how we're trying to figure out how to live our lives with some semblance of peace, with purpose, with pleasure, and with power. And all these interviews are pertaining to some way that we can contribute to this fucked up world and try to make it a little bit better than how we found it and, and all the ways we're looking to do that. So please, if you like these themes, subscribe. If you know someone who likes these themes, subscribe. Keep watching Tub Talks and think about what these conversations might look like in your tub or your hot tub or your dinner table yeah. or your Christmas tree gathering or dinner in the tub. That or, yeah. Lobster or the tub. next time you visit the Belvedere, maybe we'll see you there because we're going to go. We'll be back. I'm sure. Right. So we'll stay at my house. Oh, okay. All right. We'll talk about that. All right. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>